Hey everyone, my new Shaminid here, coming at you guys with another week in the 365 Movie Challenge. Uh, this week will be part two of the Sherlock Holmes survey that I'm going to be doing. Uh, there will be a third part, but rest assured I'm going to wait a little while. I'm definitely ready for a break <laughs> from Sherlock Holmes. This week, we're going to focus on post Basil Rathbone, as promised, basically anything made after 1945. And then when I eventually get to part three, I'll be looking at basically Basil Rathbone contemporaries, uh, movies from basically the end of the silent era up until the Basil Rathbone films, as well as a couple Sherlock Holmes spinoffs. So let's get into the Sherlock Holmes movies I watched this week. We're going to kick things off with Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace from 1962. Uh, this is famous as the only Sherlock Holmes movie in which Christopher Lee plays Sherlock Holmes. He played him on TV, uh, in a couple TV movies, but this is the only feature film in which he played. Um, this is a Severn release that was part of the Eurocrypt of Christopher Lee. Um, this is the main reason I actually bought that box set, because I was really curious to see this. Christopher Lee is someone who's been in a lot of Sherlock Holmes movies, but he hasn't played Sherlock Holmes, which is kind of crazy to think about. If you've ever seen the Hammer production of Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, Christopher Lee's in that as well, but he plays Henry Baskerville. Um, that movie was directed by Terrence Fisher, as is this one, so I was really excited to see what it had to offer, and um, to be honest, I was kind of disappointed. Most of the Sherlock Holmes movies that I watched this week really fell into two categories. There were the Basil Rathbone antecedents, and there were the sort of Sherlock Holmes deconstruction films. Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace feels like one of the pop boiler Basil Rathbone scripts. It doesn't really stick to the proper Sherlock Holmes time period, which Basil Rathbone did not either in the later films. And you've got a plot that revolves around this Egyptian necklace that Moriarty wants, and the murders he commits to get it leads Sherlock Holmes to jump into the case. And so it's just one of those Sherlock Holmes films where, you know, it's an original story, that vaguely feels like it could have been an Arthur Conan Doyle story, if not for the fact that it's set in the wrong time period, which is really a lot of the later Basil Rathbone movies to a T. And on top of it, Thoroughly Walters plays Watson in this, and he plays it, you know, bumbling goofball the way Nigel Bruce used to play it. Now, the thing that really held this movie back the most was that it was not a Hammer production, it was a German production. And that in and of itself isn't a problem, the problem comes where, you know, all the actors are dubbed, including all of these sort of hammer regulars like Thorley Walters, and most egregiously, Christopher Lee himself. Uh, he speaks English throughout the whole film, but for whatever reason, they scrubbed his voice and ADR'd it with somebody else. So that, on top of kind of a boilerplate, outdated feeling script, holds this movie back from being one of the greater Sherlock Holmes movies. If you want to watch something from this period specifically, i definitely check out The Hound of the Baskervilles if you haven't seen it, and skip The Deadly Necklace. Now another movie that might be worth checking out from the 60s featuring Sherlock Holmes is A Study in Terror, which was the second movie I watched this week. This movie probably fits somewhat into the Basil Rathbone antecedent category, primarily in the fact that, you know, Watson's kind of a bumbling buffoon in this one, as we saw in The Deadly Necklace. But on the other hand, this film gives us a pretty unique interpretation of Sherlock Holmes himself, as he's portrayed by John Neville, which I think the only movie I've actually seen John Neville in is The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, which if you've never seen that movie, oh my gosh, stop this review and go watch it. It's an incredible movie by Terry Gilliam. But overall, he does a great job of presenting the, you know, giddy anticipation of the hunt. And he's supported by a fairly interesting script, um, which as you can see is teased out on the bottom here, which is that this is the film where Sherlock Holmes uh, faces off against Jack the Ripper which, um, you know, if you take Holmes as a historical figure, he was operating in London at the time of Jack the Ripper. And so it's interesting seeing him go through some of the points of the Jack the Ripper case. Now, this isn't actually the last time we'll see Jack the Ripper in this week's list of movies, um, but I would say this was the better of the two 
Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper movies that I did watch. It doesn't really take a lot from Jack the Ripper lore. It just kind of sets up its own narrative with its own cast of characters and, you know, really feels like a whodunit with sort of a veneer of the Jack the Ripper timeline sort of over the top of it. Kate and I had a lot of fun trying to guess who the killer was actually going to be. Uh, and when we found out who it was, it was kind of like, oh, a little bit disappointing. Um, we, you know, it was like, it felt like it was maybe a little too obvious who the person was. Um, but we were convinced that the movie had us tricked, so we were having a blast just calling out various different people, including probably the most ridiculous theory that we came up with, which was that Judy Dench was dressing up as a man and going around killing prostitutes, which one of her first performances in this in this movie, which was really cool to see, at the end of this movie, you have this tightrope where you want Sherlock Holmes to solve the case, but somehow the public has to never find out who the killer was. And the movie didn't have a satisfactory explanation as to why we wouldn't have found out who it was eventually. So certainly not a perfect movie, but John Neville isn't bad as Sherlock Holmes, Watson is just okay, and overall it was a fun ride while we were on it. Okay, so getting out of the 60s, we're going to move into the 70s, where we get into some of the sort of deconstructionist versions of Sherlock Holmes. And so the first of those is going to be Billy Wilder's The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, which was a bizarre movie, to say the least. I'm not entirely sure even where to begin. The big thing that this movie tries to tackle is... You know, Sherlock Holmes is sort of a sexless character, right? He's obsessed with detail and solving crimes and, you know, his mind is moving a mile a minute and he's emotionless beyond the depression he feels when he's intellectually bored. And so this film really tries to pick that apart. And so for the first part of the movie, we have this really long drawn out sequence in which Holmes and Watson go to the ballet and Holmes is propositioned by one of the stars of the ballet, and she doesn't want to have a relationship with Holmes, she literally just wants him to provide her a child. And he declines, basically insinuating that he's gay and Dr. Watson is his lover, which of course really upsets Dr. Watson, but it sort of leaves this question in your mind of, is Sherlock Holmes secretly pining after Dr. Watson? After And after engaging with you know, Sherlock Holmes' sexuality in the first third of the movie, the last two-thirds of the movie, which centers around this woman and her search for her husband, leads to dealing with Sherlock Holmes' romantic life, uh, because he sort of develops a relationship with this woman, she's not all she turns out to be, and it sort of leads to a bittersweet ending. And so the movie feels very disjointed, but it's also interesting because you're kind of getting two halves of Sherlock Holmes' love life. Now, I haven't even gotten to the part with the Loch Ness Monster, but I'm not even going to tell you about that. Maybe you should just go watch the movie, because this is the only movie I can think of that opens with a ballet and ends with a mystery around the Loch Ness Monster. The last thing I want to call out about this movie is that it also features Christopher Lee. This time, however, he's playing Mycroft Holmes, which was kind of cool. And on the extras for this movie, actually... Um, there's an interview with Christopher Lee in which he points out he's the only actor to ever play both Sherlock Holmes and Sherlock Holmes' older brother, which was kind of a cool point. I didn't realize that. Also, if you want to learn more about Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace, uh, this Blu-ray is a great place to do it because most of his interview, he spends complaining <laughs> about Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace and how that movie turned out, which was kind of funny. The next film on my list was without a doubt my favorite film that I watched this week. Absolutely fantastic Sherlock Holmes movie that I would recommend to anyone. And that movie is The 7% Solution. Um, this is a movie that I feel like was pretty famous for its time. I want to say it was nominated for Academy Awards. It was based on a best-selling book. But it's kind of been lost to obscurity since, despite being a really clever story. Thankfully, Shout Factory was here to provide us with a great little special edition, although it only has an interview with the screenwriter, which is a little bit disappointing, but it's got a decent enough transfer, and, um, you know, it's better to have a special feature rather than no special features. But the core selling point of this movie 
is that this is the movie where Sherlock Holmes meets Sigmund Freud, which is kind of a fun, quaint idea on its face. But what Nicholas Meyer does with that idea as a story is fascinating, actually. Because unlike any of the other movies that I watched this week, all of which usually would have some kind of a line or a moment where they called out the fact that Sherlock Holmes is a cocaine addict, they never really engage with it. This movie puts it front and center. So the film opens with Sherlock Holmes obsessed with Professor Moriarty. He's out there, he's a criminal mastermind, and what's brilliant is no one knows he even exists, right? The classic sense we get of who Moriarty is. Um, but this movie plays with your expectation, because after we see Holmes on this search for Moriarty, we actually meet Moriarty, because he goes to visit Dr. Watson, and he's like, look, Sherlock Holmes is stalking me, and I'm just an innocent guy, and Sherlock Holmes is obsessed. And it turns out that, really, Moriarty is a figment of Sherlock Holmes's cocaine habit. Now, there's a lot more to both, you know, the reasons behind his cocaine habit and why he's fixated on Moriarty that I'm not going to spoil for you guys because it's actually very interesting how it plays out. But what a twist on the Sherlock Holmes-Moriarty dynamic. Um, all of this leads Dr. Watson to take Sherlock Holmes to Sigmund Freud, who, and this is played by Alan Arkin, which I think is great, actually. I mean, you know, it's Alan Arkin. It's hard not to see Alan Arkin doing a Freud impression, um, but that's okay. Like, the, the movie's played so broadly, and Sigmund Freud is, you know, it's he's not the historical Sigmund Freud, right? Like, he's a much more theatrical caricature, which makes his performance work really well. And it's basically about him rehabilitating Sherlock Holmes, but him also enlisting Sherlock Holmes's help to solve the case of one of his missing patients, which is played by Vanessa Redgrave. Alan Arkin is great, and I don't think I've talked about it yet, but Nicole Williamson, who, if you've ever seen the movie Excalibur, he plays Merlin in that. Another actor, I actually haven't seen a lot of his movies, but whenever I do, my jaw's on the floor. This is another one like that. I mean, his Holmes is amazing. Uh, it helps that, you know, he's got so much to chew on in this script. Um, this is a movie about Sherlock Holmes, uh, not necessarily about a case. So, you know, he really has the chance to shine and absolutely steps up to the plate. Um, overall, just absolutely fantastic movie. It doesn't take itself too seriously, despite the fact it's dealing with very serious subject matter. All right, next up is the one movie that I watched on Amazon this week, and that was Murder by Decree. I thought about picking this one up, and by the time I was, like, ready to actually buy it, it wouldn't have gotten to me on time to present it to you guys for this review, so I was just like, eh, I'll just watch it. And then I booted up my Prime on my PlayStation 5, and I just want to just take a moment to call out how much streaming Amazon Prime in particular sucks. Um, you know, I have a PlayStation 5. It has a solid state drive, and somehow it takes Amazon Prime longer to load than Netflix did on the PS3 when it still had a disc that you had to put in. Amazon makes so much money, and they take absolutely zero pride in the product they put out there. So on one hand, I kind of regretted that I didn't go out of my way to buy this movie just because I didn't want to give Amazon $3.99 to watch a movie in standard definition because they don't offer the high-def version of it to begin with. But ultimately, in the case of this movie, maybe it's a matter of lesser of two evils because this was probably my least favorite movie I watched this week. I think Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace was a worse movie, but this was a worse Sherlock Holmes movie. Um, Christopher Plummer plays Sherlock Holmes, which I was very skeptical of going in, and um, he's just not right for the role. Now, this is the other Jack the Ripper take, and unlike Study in Terror, which I would consider kind of a Basil Rathbone antecedent, this one is much more in the deconstructionist role, but I just wasn't quite clear what they were trying to actually deconstruct. Ultimately, this movie is really trying to engage with the audience on issues of class in Great Britain. This take on Jack the Ripper is very much deep in conspiracy territory. We've got the Freemasons in this. You know, they're protecting the monarchy of Great Britain because there's an illegitimate child out there that a bunch of prostitutes have found out about, so they create this Jack the Ripper persona. 
to do their dirty work. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson become very disillusioned with the state of the monarchy. But is Sherlock Holmes someone who's ever been tied to the monarchy and the power structures of Great Britain? Like, I would say no. If anything, he's already kind of opposed to it because Mycroft Holmes is a figurehead of protecting the crown. And Sherlock Holmes is kind of like, you know, the black sheep, dumber brother of the two. And so he's very much an apolitical character that they force this political angle onto. And I just don't think that Sherlock Holmes was the right person to do that with. I think there's an interesting movie here. It's just not a Sherlock Holmes movie. Um, I will give them credit. James Mason plays Watson and he's a solid Watson. Like he's not the bumbling buffoon. He's actually very engaged, helping investigate really a great performance unfortunately hindered by the fact that james mason is just way too old for the role when you get to him in this movie which is unfortunate to make matters worse you know this movie is two hours and four minutes and i counted every minute of it because it's just way too long um there's a lot of just kind of walking around the same studio back lot and sets looking for clues um and not really advancing the story. My Nusha wife watched this movie with me and she fell asleep a half hour in. She woke up probably a half hour, 40 minutes later, and we were no further in the story. She literally was like, oh, I didn't even miss anything. And I was like, no, you really didn't. Better movie overall than The Deadly Necklace, but I would, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't recommend either of them, but if you had to pick, I'd rather watch Christopher Lee for 80 minutes then watch Christopher Plummer for over two hours. All right, penultimate movie was my rewatch of the week. Another movie I haven't seen since the VHS days, and I picked it up on Blu-ray when it came out back in 2012 and had never got around to rewatching it. Finally sat down and did it this week, and that is The Great Mouse Detective. It was kind of interesting coming back to this after having watched Without a Clue last week because Henry Mancini does the music for Without a Clue and also does the music for this, which came out in 1986. So um, very similar scores. To be honest, I don't even know exactly what to say about this movie. I mean, you know, it's a Disney classic, 75 minutes in and out, very straightforward story. Not really a deconstruction of Sherlock Holmes, more of a love letter to Sherlock Holmes. I wouldn't really want to call this a Basil Rathbone antecedent, um, but it is definitely an homage. The Sherlock Holmes mouse is named Basil. Um, he lives underneath 221B Baker Street, and when he goes up to the main floor where Sherlock Holmes lives, you see his shadow and Sherlock Holmes talking, and they actually used Basil Rathbone's voice for that moment, which was really, really cool. I don't watch a lot of cartoons, mainly because I sort of decided about probably in 2012 that I'm going to wait until I have kids because I'm going to watch a zillion cartoons then. I do like cartoons, I just, you know, have focused on other things. <clears throat> this is actually the first cartoon I've probably watched in at least five years. Um, maybe since Up came out. Whenever Up came out was probably the last time I actually watched a cartoon. And while this movie doesn't reach the heights of like Aladdin or Beauty and the Beast or some of those classic 90s Disney movies, um, you know, this is early work from a lot of the same artists. Uh, you have some early computer work in this um, that was later made much more famous with Beauty and the Beast. And so I would say this is probably an underrated Disney movie, although, I mean, it's a Disney movie, so... You know, they've all got their fans. Everyone knows all the Disney movies. So it's a Disney classic. Go watch it. All right. Final movie of the week. Again, a deconstruction of the Sherlock Holmes character. A really interesting little film. I was not sure exactly how I felt about it. Um, I had to sleep on it and decided that I liked it. Uh, and that movie is Mr. Holmes, in which Ian McKellen plays Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he's much older tending his bees, which he has famously attributed to wanting to do when he retires, and uh, he's dealing with memory loss, and he's trying to remember his last case because it actually caused him to get out of detective work altogether, and he can't remember why, and it's driving him crazy. And so the movie is simultaneously about him tending his bees and his housekeeper and her son and the relationship he has with Sherlock Holmes, 
and then also slowly parceling out this final case and what has happened to this woman that he was hired to investigate. This is a movie that's kind of tough to talk about without spoiling. And since it's kind of a newer movie, I want to try to avoid spoilers. I guess what I'll say is that ultimately this movie is concerned with Holmes as an emotional person. You know, again, kind of like Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, you know, they make a point of Sherlock Holmes is an analytical mind. And this movie heavily deals with truth versus fact. And when maybe telling a lie is actually the right thing to do in that moment. A very fitting use of the Sherlock Holmes character. Part of the problem is it's coming on the heels of the 7% solution though, which was so clever and steeped in Sherlock Holmes lore. Whereas this, they spend a lot of time saying, well, you know, that's just the stories. Like this is what the real Sherlock Holmes is. And so they really just cherry pick the elements of Holmes that they want to engage with and then sort of dismiss kind of a lot to get to the ending that they want, which bothered me a little bit. I just felt like it was a little bit lazy. They could have been a little bit more engaged with the character. For example, the final Sherlock Holmes case that causes him to get out of detective work is a story that supposedly Watson told. He just changed the ending. But if you're going to do that, it should be a story that we can point to in the canonical 60 stories and it's not because they either didn't want to find a story that fit their narrative or they couldn't find a story that fit their narrative and so they just kind of did their own thing and then the other thing that bothered me about this movie is there's a point where Sherlock Holmes goes to see himself on the screen and you know this movie takes place during World War II or shortly after and so this is definitively like Basil Rathbone era Sherlock Holmes. And while I get that you're seeing it through Holmes's eyes and he's like disgusted by it because this is not me, the footage that they show from the movies is 185% disconnected from what those Basil Rathbone movies were like. It was just this pastiche of what someone thought old-timey Sherlock Holmes movies would be like. Completely disconnected with what old Sherlock Holmes movies were actually like. That sequence of the film actually reminded me when I did the Mimiverse marathon and he was like spoofing 50s movies. Like that was the tone and the style of filmmaking that they presented on the screen. It just didn't represent anything. It was just total nonsense and was just there, I guess, to give you a laugh. But it wasn't funny and it also wasn't accurate. Now, as much as I've complained about this movie, like I said, I did fall on the side of liking it because it does have a strong emotional backbone. It is an interesting exploration of Sherlock Holmes as a character. It just drops literally everything else. It gets a little bit saccharine, but not too bad. The big emotional ending on one level feels like a little bit student writing where it's like and then this happens and it's so emotional and you're like oh my god you did that like you know it's just like too obvious um to the point that it's a little bit eye rolling but what makes it work is there's also a vague element of investigation that goes into it and Sherlock Holmes pieces a couple of things together that makes for kind of a great Sherlock Holmes moment that sort of subverts the trite indie film screenwriting tropes that the film is kind of steeped in in that moment. So it ultimately works out. I liked Ian McKellen. Didn't really care for Laura Linney, but I don't like Laura Linney in anything, really. Sorry. So is what it is. Um, if you haven't seen Mr. Holmes, maybe give it a watch. But the main movies I'd really recommend from my viewings this week go to The Great Mouse Detective, which you've probably already seen. If you're interested in something that's just kind of batshit crazy, Private Life of Sherlock Holmes is a wild ride, and I definitely recommend it, even though it's not necessarily a great movie. It's a fun movie to watch. Um, and then far and away, best movie of the week, 7% Solution was just... It's almost not comparable because it is so deconstructionist, but this movie, absolutely killer. Can't recommend it enough. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this week's reviews. I uh, hope you're not totally tired of Sherlock Holmes. I'll be honest, I'm a little tired of Sherlock Holmes now after another week, so it'll be a little while before I do part three, but there is a part three coming. Next week, I'm going to tackle something completely different. Not sure exactly what that's going to be, but I will likely tie it into a movie I'm going to see this weekend, and that's the only hint I'm going to give you. I'll leave it up to you to guess what movie exactly that is I'm going to see. So I hope you guys have a great week in movies. Thanks for watching these reviews, and take care.